Hey. <laughs> Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. What did the cowboy say at his second rodeo? I don't know, Lily. What did the cowboy say? <laughs> this ain't my first rodeo. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Why am I laughing at that? It's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, It might be my new favourite joke. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's pre-read media tick. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah! Yeah. (laughs) And in case you're new here, welcome. And make sure to stick around in case you're confused. We always start and end with dad jokes. And we hope for these jokes to become more cringy every time. (laughs) Plus, at the end, we always give a recommendation of something we've been enjoying recently. So stick around for that. Please do. And yeah, so today we will be talking about the 1991 film Thelma and Louise, directed by Ridley Scott and written by Callie Curry. Yeah. This episode will cover sexual assault, murder, suicide. Please check for further trigger warnings on the film online. We will be discussing the sexual assault scene in this movie at certain points. We will put those infos in the description if you would like to skip it. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to be mentioned in the summary of the film. Yeah. So, Anna, what what does happen in this film? Tell us. (laughs) So Thelma, a housewife, and Louise, a waitress, plan to go to a cabin to fish and relax. Thelma's husband, Daryl, is quite controlling and is therefore not informed by Thelma, who sneaks out the house like a teenager. On the way, they take a break at a roadhouse bar. There, a stranger named Harlan flirts with them and dances with Thelma and later attempts to rape her. He only stops once Louise exits the bar and threatens him with a gun. He keeps assaulting them verbally, so Louise shoots him. They drive off and try to regroup at a motel and Louise decides to run to Mexico asking her boyfriend Jimmy to send her money to Oklahoma City to be able to do that on the road to get the money they pick up a hitchhiker named JD When they arrive, they find Jimmy shows up in person with the money. He and Louise decide to end things after he, in a last-ditch attempt, proposes to her with a rose. (laughs) Meanwhile, JD and Thelma are having sex in the next room. Thelma comes down the next morning telling Louise about the satisfying hookup. But JD, who turns out to be an asshole, steals Louise's money that she left with Thelma. Thelma takes over the wheel from a distraught Louise and robs the store. And the journey continues in earnest. Meanwhile, a cop named Tal Slocum is tracking the two women for the murder of Harlan. He gets the FBI involved and they set mm-hmm. up shop at Thelma and Daryl's house and start negotiating with the women over the phone. Thelma and Louise get stopped by a state trooper who they lock in his trunk <laughs> after taking his gun, ammunition and glasses. But they ask nicely. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're so polite. So polite. Yeah. <laughs> and they keep driving and are ultimately found by the authorities and are almost chased into the Grand Canyon. The cops <laughs> with cars, guns, and a helicopter, they corner them, but Thelma and Louise decide not to get caught. They keep driving directly keep driving. off the edge <laughs> of the Grand Canyon. And that is the plot summary yeah. of what happens in Thelma and Louise. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Lily, pray tell, what is pre-read text? (laughs) Well, Anna, funny you should ask. So, yeah, our podcast is focused on this idea of pre-read text. If you're new here, pre-read text is a term coined by YouTuber Rowan Ellis, which describes this sort of phenomenon when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it's about through interacting with various adaptations of the original material. And these adaptations create a cultural consciousness of the story, characters, images, concepts, etc. from that media, which might have very little or even nothing at all to do with the original source material, and instead all come from the adaptations that have come after it, and basically people's interpretations of those texts. So a really famous example would be Sherlock Holmes or pirate stories. You probably haven't personally read the Sherlock Holmes books, but you know what Sherlock Holmes looks like because it's been readapted mm. so many times, stuff like that. So how does Thelma and Louise fit into that? So I think everybody knows the iconic 
closing shot of them driving off the cliff. If you've never seen the film, you still know that scene. I only watched the film about like a month, two months ago for the first time. Same. But when I watched that final scene, I was like, A, I just know of it through just pop culture. I know they drive off the cliff at the end. And B, I was like, oh, this shot is really familiar. I think I've seen this in different documentaries about films and I think there was even a documentary that was about kind of goofs in films basically and it was like oh here's why there's some metal falling off the car at the bottom of it I can't really remember now but I've seen that shot so many times do you remember where you first saw this scene or if you'd seen it before I'm sort of sure where I heard about it the first time but I mm. don't know where I've seen that shot for the first time because it's so often referenced yeah. as a famous 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 shot and I watched this for a course uh, this was just on the syllabus for a course on like American road narratives and the symbol of the American road and I'm kind of mad that I haven't seen it before because it's a really good <laughs> movie but again I knew it is. I knew that scene, even if I'd never, even though I'd never seen this film. Yeah, I think that's another thing I knew about it was that it was supposed to be a really good film, and I was like, oh, can it really be that good if everyone says it's a good film? And yeah. I was like, oh no, oh no, it is a good. Film. Oh, actually, yeah, no, they were right about this one. <laughs> but also, it's been parodied in a lot of different media. Mm -hmm. But the thing that first leapt to mind for me was that I'm sure The Simpsons have done a parody of this. I'm sure they have. And yeah, in season five, episode six, they have an episode called Marge on the Lamb which is basically Marge wins tickets to go see the ballet and Homer doesn't want to go. And so she goes with her friend Ruth instead. And then they have a fun time and then they go out again and they shoot some cans in a farm and then they go on the run from the police because the tail light of the car is out. But also Ruth has stolen the car from her ex-husband and then everything escalates really quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, other names for that episode. So Marge on the Lamb in English, but in German it's Die, Rebe sorry, Die Rebellischen Weiber. Is that, sorry, is that terrible? Very good. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. Sorry, there um, was an episode before where Lily said something in German. And for some reason, I don't know why, but on the recording, I'm like, yeah, it's fine. The pronunciation <laughs> was perfect. When I when I edited that bit, I was like, why do I sound so dismissive? That was so well done. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's not perfect. that impressive, but I appreciate. Thank you. But that translates as the rebellious women. Yes. And then in Japanese, the title is Margin Ruth, which is a very obvious parallel to Thumb and Louise. So I think what this kind of illustrates is that this film is known as being about rebellious women, about escaping from patriarchy and oppressive husbands or male figures, and about female friendship. Yeah. Also, Viber means, sorry, I'm just never realizing, Viber means like more yeah. like broads. Ooh, so it's, you yeah. know, the rebellious broads, which I like. That's a nice title. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So pre-read text doesn't mean misconceptions necessarily. It's just stuff you know because you've literally pre-read. This text has been pre-read for you through adaptations and through mm. popular culture and everything. And with this movie, it seems to be remembered quite well. The core aspects yeah. remain. And we think that the reason for that is because the script is such a strong script. It's so good. And my first memory of caring about them on Louise was in Gilmore Girls, where Paris mm. says to Rory, I'm sorry if you thought that we had some kind of deep Thelma and Louise thing going here but we didn't <laughs> <laughs> and so it is this idea of a deep friendship right it mm -hmm. is referencing that and I think that's amazing there's so many movies that are misremembered and this movie is remembered for what it's about which is this shot but also just this friendship at the core of it yeah yeah absolutely and I think our focus today looking at that pre-read text is that we'll be looking at how the film specifically explores rebellion and freedom under patriarchy using tropes of like masculine genres such as westerns and road movies and then how this leads up to that iconic end scene I think another thing that this film is remembered for is it being a film about outlaw which we're yeah. going to talk a bit more about right now. <laughs> <laughs> So there's different Western tropes that exist. And it's also this idea of Thelma and Louisa being a feminist film. And yes. we're going to look at how the film uses Western tropes, but also what does it look like to be a female outlaw, but under patriarchy? What does that yes. do with an outlaw narrative? And we are yeah. asking, can these tropes that exist here be reclaimed? Absolutely. So the film Thelma and Louise follows in this tradition of Westerns and outlaw movies where two main characters are outlaws, the kind of main protagonists of the film. So thinking about like Bonnie and Clyde, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids, I think it's quite cool that when you hear Thelma and Louise, at least for me, you know exactly what that film is. Yeah. It's a very, like, even though the names are quite generic names, it's a very iconic title. And That's such a good point. Yeah. And I immediately categorize it with Bonnie and Clyde and those sorts of narratives. So some Western tropes that you see in Thelma and Louise are a woman with a past, which is a slightly weird way of phrasing it, but I think what it means is a woman with a traumatic past. 
which it's quite interesting how they explore that in the film because namely that's Louise and there's always this reference to something that happened to her in Texas but the film never goes there and it gives her the agency to in the narrative to sort of say actually no we're not gonna look at this past that I have which is really interesting then you have the lone wolf which could be JD this mm. guy on his own on the road making his way in the west but also I could maybe argue also Louise maybe a little bit yeah she starts off as the lone wolf yeah she's not tied down yeah 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 I feel like there's a lot of kind of western imagery even if the tropes aren't used in lots of detail so when we first see JD he's in that cowboy hat and with tumbleweed all around him or the second time we see JD he's often framed in this very western archetypal way as Sam and Louise are driving through on their journey they come across towards the end there's a cattle drive and you see them trying to get their car through this herd of cattle and they're like get out of our way yeah um, and then you also have the sheriff which here I would argue is Cal Slocum yeah definitely. chasing the outlaws and maybe also the bounty hunters which maybe could be the FBI here yeah yeah Thelma and Louise definitely have a kind of bounty on their head obviously it's the law and they're trying to take them in but it kind of follows that trope of them having a bounty on them trusty steeds specifically i think louise's car what kind of car is it again oh man it was something thunderbird greenbird thunderbird yeah what's that car called sorry i think it's a t-bird sorry ah. <laughs> a 1966 ford thunderbird ah That's so yeah it it's the trusty steed <laughs> trusty steed is yeah louise's thunderbird and then also this trope of bar fights, duels and shootouts, which is quite a key one because that's sort of obviously when the, what's it called? Um, in the inciting incident. Inciting incident. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The inciting incident is this bar fight and it's very specifically rooted in gendered violence. Yeah. Um, and that sort of propels the women's narrative forward and sets that framing of this being an outlaw movie that's specifically interested in what it's like to be marginalized under patriarchy and also links very closely to another really important trope, which is the idea of frontier justice. Can you explain to us what frontier justice is, Anna? <laughs> frontier justice is again a trope that exists in a lot of Western movies. It's extrajudicial, mm -hmm. which is super important. So it's outside of our understanding of a system of justice. So it's being so far removed from established structures and law as in big cities because you're so far out in the West. Sort of anything goes, like vigilantism, vigilantism, sorry. Um, <laughs> and Thelma and Louise become outlaws and go on the run, specifically as a form of justice against gendered violence. They don't do this because they just feel like committing crimes in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They do this having to run away because they know that there is no institutional justice in regards to what happened with Harlan. And one of the best lines in the script is Louise talking to Thelma, mm -hmm. explaining why they can't go to the cops, saying, we don't live in that kind of a world, Thelma. It just is impossible for them yeah yeah it's interesting to look at it as a film about the limits of frontier justice in a patriarchal 90s america they take that into their own hands and then throughout the film it's them trying to find this justice but never being able to escape the arm of the law in the way that in westerns you arguably could kind of find that frontier justice yeah we deal here with a different gender doing this and we also deal with a different time absolutely yeah 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 completely and are they reimagining these old tropes to explore the idea of the feminist outlaw and susan mm -hmm. sarandon in the making off of this movie said that this movie is essentially chicks instead of cowboys and cars instead of horses so they were very aware of the old tropes that exist and the screenwriter worked a lot with the director also referencing all the westerns that they were thinking about in these type of narratives and so yeah that brings us nicely on to looking specifically at outlaw tropes so we see these characters play out, these outlaw personas. A very obvious example of this is when Thelma robs the grocery store. Yeah. She's sort of like living out this, <laughs> she's like living out this cowboy fantasy and she's literally performing. She's citing lines that she learned from JD on how to rob a store. And arguably these lines they feel very familiar and we can kind of infer that JD probably also got these from TV or from movies, especially the way he's presented as this kind of archetypal kind of cowboy figure we are gonna reference different things from two texts and one of them is driving visions by david letterman and while talking about the scene where jd teaches thelma to rob he asks has she appropriated his knowledge or is she subservient to it so mm. is she copying this masculinity or is she following a man's script or is mm -hmm. she claiming this as herself yeah and is that helping her in her own liberation yeah because <laughs> um, i think what's really interesting in this film is that 
quite literally the like Thelma and Louise wear the hats of men and you know when you put on a hat you're kind of becoming their role so Louise gets this cowboy hat at a gas station from a man that sat there and it's this very quite iconic exchange of this feminine jewelry in exchange for the masculine cowboy hat and then later in the film Thelma takes a hat from like a baseball cap type thing yeah off of a sexist truck driver. I think that's interesting to think about whether or not they're sort of becoming these archetypes, reproducing them, or whether they're doing something slightly different with them. And I think the scene where Thelma and Louise shoot up this truck is a really interesting scene to analyze that a bit more. Thelma, when she robs the store, it's also interesting because she borrows Louise's glasses. So if she's appropriating JD's knowledge, she's also performing, she's also borrowing courage from her friend, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's not as simple as just her kind of taking on JD's role. She's also borrowing from Louise, which if you look at Thelma as a character, it complicates it more than her just becoming more like a man. No, she's yeah. like kind of finding these different elements and bringing them into herself. Yeah. Yeah. So this figure of the truck driver named Earl keeps popping up all along their route as they make their journey south. Even as early as when they pick up JD, you hear this truck beeping at them. And it's not explicitly at that moment tied to this particular figure of uh, it might be a completely different truck driver, but it sets up that motif, this motif of this ever present truck driver on the road, which I think Anna, you argued is this representation of this inescapable patriarchy. And there's this sense that truck drivers are the cowboys of modern America or on this road. They are this masculine figure. They have their, in a way, their steeds as well. Their yeah. Truck, they're like lorries that they're riding and i think it's also significant that the truck driver is called earl there's the very famous chick song goodbye earl which is a song where two women reunite to murder one of their husbands who's this abusive character and then afterwards they live together and make strawberry jam and so this feels like it sort of helps to present earl as this masculine figure of misogyny yeah, absolutely. And meeting Earl before they realize what he is, Thelma says, oh, truck driver is always so nice because he lets them pass, but he only lets them pass in order to harass them. And so mm. in this movie, it's showing you that chivalry is so fake. Like this idea yeah. of like a man will open the door for you, whatever. In a movie like this, it would be a man opening the door for you in order to grab your ass better. He doesn't let them pass because he's nice or kind. It's because he wants to harass them and he cannot do that when they're so far behind him. Him. so they trick him into following them off road and they call him out and he doesn't apologize and then they decide to again we're talking about vigilante justice he doesn't apologize mm -hmm. and then they decide to shoot at the truck yeah and it's this very destructive moment the truck literally goes up i mean they shoot the tires at first mm -hmm. and which is this castration of this very phallic symbol of the massive truck and then they shoot at the tank itself, and then it goes up in this massive explosion. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> and I think when they were filming this, all the film crew had to get really far away from it. They cleared everybody for miles, and then Susan Sarandon was like, then why are we so close to this? Because they actually let the huge truck explode for the shot, and they wanted the authentic reaction of the actresses. And later, the actresses talked about how they just stared like blank face at this thing. <laughs> and so they still had to figure out, okay, like acting, we have to act here. Like, yeah. <laughs> but they had to decide what kind of faces are we going to make? Because their re real authentic reaction to this was just, just open mouth face, just going, uh, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, This truck could be seen as a patriarchal symbol because it is so shiny and mm. because it's metal, it's so reflective. It's never about what you see. It's always about th them having to look at themselves. So patriarchy mm. always reduces you as a thing to be looked at, not a thing to be looking. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in that moment, there's a sense that they're giving Earl a taste of his own medicine. Yeah, It's like they get to be the heroes and turn this heroic cowboy violence against their villain, which is this caricature of patriarchy. And they become these cowboy figures in their stance and their camera framing. The way that they sit on the car. Yeah, literally. And they're wearing these jeans outfits. It's very old west kind of cowboy aesthetic. And they drive circles around Earl before they leave him in this very taunting kind of way. Yeah. And when I first watched this scene, I just, I really liked it because I thought it was really funny that they aren't just shown as being, you know, like victims, that they also do stuff that isn't good or decent, that they are mm -hmm. living out their vigilante justice. But reading about it also in the texts that we read for this, they talked about how this was feminist. And I was like, that's so girl bossy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get that the scene is very heavy handed, but it didn't feel 
feel girl bossy to me watching it, but the way that it's written about, I feel it's very girl bossy. Yeah, I think the point of the scene is to show their freedom because it's not necessarily like that other crimes or it's actually yeah. more in common to their first crime of Louise shooting Harlan because the reason she shoots him isn't because he's of immediate danger to Thelma because they've gotten out of that situation. But as Brigham points out, which is another reading that we did, the reason that Louise shoots Harlan is because Harlan won't apologise. And that's the same thing that Earl is doing here. Earl won't apologise for the way he's treating them. And so it becomes not about their immediate survival, but about asserting their form of justice yeah, and about showing their freedom. But I don't think that's saying this is the right way to approach justice. It shows these two characters having such depth. You know what I mean? They're not just good. They're not just decent. They're not just victims. They're not just doing things for the quote unquote right reasons. And mm. it is not necessary to ruin the environment, though, in the process of being a vigilante yeah. even. Yeah, because it's something you could be quite critical of in this moment is how destructive this is being. Yeah. It's like in, the, in this frontier justice that they're performing, they're asserting their power over not just Earl, but over this lawless, quote unquote, lawless land. Yeah. And, you know, they feel like they can create this massive explosion because it won't harm anyone. They have the authority to do that in this land, yeah. which relies on this idea that this land is empty land like Terra Nullius, which is this myth that white settlers, when they came to quote unquote the new world, used to be like, oh, yeah, we can t take over this place because there's nobody living here. So therefore it can belong to us, which is very disrespectful towards the land and ends up being very destructive towards the land and also ignores the indigenous people that were already living there on that land in the first place. As they're destroying this truck, while they're asserting themselves in that way, by using these masculine tropes of the Western and the outlaw, they're reasserting this white settler narrative at the same time, even as they're trying to assert their own liberation. Yeah. And overall, I just didn't like Earl as a character when I watched this. No. It just felt yeah. so flat to me. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the sexist dudes that that girl character in Stranger Things works with at the newspaper. Just like oh, yeah. really flat yeah. sexism. I'm not saying that people like Earl don't exist because obviously they do everywhere and to this day, that's not a new thing. But I just think that where Daryl is given more depth and feels more like a funny caricature, Earl only exists as a vehicle for them to be able to girl boss. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> And I understand that as the purpose of the scene, but yeah, it means he's a very flat character if you just look at him as a character yeah. himself. And so yeah, from these criticisms of this scene and how these women perform this patriarchal outlaw stereotype, even for kind of quote unquote feminist reasons, are these characters themselves subverting these tropes or are they more like reproducing the violence behind this persona and this masculine violence towards people, but also towards the land and perpetuating this empty land narrative? Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I find it so bizarre that the text framed this itself, this one scene is mm. so feminist, because we were both saying that the film overall itself is critical of this. They are reproducing and not satirizing these tropes in that scene. But overall, the movie mm. is very critical of this kind of narrative and very aware of all the tropes with Western. So, yeah. Definitely. So there's another genre that this film falls into and arguably subverts, which is the road narrative. Yes. So yeah, so this idea of the roads is quite closely linked to Westerns and a similar masculinity or a liberatory masculinity, like the freedom of the roads. And uh, it's about exploring and going west in this very American way, finding yourself in this empty space, like open roads. New possibilities. Yeah, completely. And it crops up as kind of 50s, 60s counterculture and is really closely tied to capitalism and oil. Yeah. And I think the film references that in itself because the first time that Thelma and Louise go off roads into this oil farm and there are all these nodding donkeys getting oil out of the ground, I think the film is quite aware of the oil and the petrol culture, if you want to look at it in a broader term, that goes into this freedom that these women are allowed on the road. Yeah, and these roads also exist as a symbol, but also just exist for American capitalism. Because the reason you have roads is not just so you can get home or get to the cinema, it's also for transporting goods. And that's why the mm. road is so important within American capitalism and capitalism overall. It's there to transport things and transport goods that can be sold and bought and traded. And you also have very famously the book On the Road by Jack Kerouac, which, again, is a reference to going out on the road and exploring. Obviously, again, very masculine idea of liberation, white male 
um, masculine mm, yeah. liberation on the road. Completely. And Lee had made this great connection when we were talking about road narratives and stuff, which I didn't even think about before. Yeah, it made me think of this idea of freedom on the road and freedom in the margins of society. It made me think about Our Flag Means Death. We've done two episodes on Our Flag Means Death. Go listen to those. But that's all about the freedom of the sea and how the sea offers this space beyond civilization where there's a freedom to break from societal norms where you can become an outlaw like Thelma and Louise on the road and break away from society. But there's some really key differences between the freedom of the road and the freedom of the sea. Because Our Flag Means Death is set during the Golden Age of Piracy. I believe it's 1600s, it might be 1700s, but sort of around that era. And it's this era of mapping and discovery and that's colonial mapping and expansion of empire. And so ships are about discovery in this very grand sense. Whereas cars, you know, car journeys take place on roads. They're in places that have already been mapped. So car journeys, especially in this American setting, are about individual freedom of discovery and individual kind of discovery from within whilst you're doing this grand journey. Which when you're, um, <laughs> if you're a protagonist trapped in a patriarchal society, this individual liberation that comes from this car journey can only really go so far. Yeah, um, and this movie also takes place in such a different time. So I can like, when yes. you're on a ship, you might still go places where someone like you has never been before. But if there's a road there, it's <laughs> it was mm. literally paved before you. The road was already made for you. And this movie is in such a different time. And because this was literally made in the 90s. Mm, but yeah. watching it now is so interesting because this is also about this era. If you watch this movie, that's the end of the 20th century. You have this cult of freedom in the 90s, ongoing from the 80s but everything is analog they constantly have to drive to a phone to talk to Daryl or talk to Hal Sokum and this is just before the internet became mainstream this is prior to the Clinton Lewinsky scandal which everyone had access to because they read about it on blogs for example just sorry I'm just referencing 90s things yeah <laughs> and the telephone lines it's so interesting because Western Union obviously plays a part in this story and Western Union started as a telegram company in the old west that's how telegrams were transported and you have pay phones which again keep just disappearing everywhere and you just have the ability to just get lost still in the 90s yes. for yourself but also just from civilization you can hide and you just not as watched constantly by cctv there just is a lot less surveillance and one of the few times where they are surveilled is when they're in the store when thelma is robbing the store mm -hmm. yeah you have that cctv footage and also because was able to identify louise's car yes. through like registration number plate registration yeah. so you have this creeping sense that surveillance is coming yes and obviously from a modern standpoint you're like this is about you know this would not be possible in the next like 10 years but yeah it kind of that encapsulates that time when it, you're just able to do this grand road narrative because now well, you'd have like a mobile phone and that would make everything a lot more complicated it's almost like them and louisa sort of like the last hurrah of the analog culture <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Also, you can see that by the 90s, that this genre of the road movie is kind of beginning to wane in some aspects. Because you yeah. have, obviously, it's a masculine genre of the 60s counterculture. This is the end of an era, too, if you think about how expensive it is to just have a car now. Because this, again, was when having a car was just a, a normal thing at the time. Because in the 70s, there were so many oil crises. And then in the 80s, oil became really cheap again. So people just became, again, mm. more reliant on cars overall. And then this is the 90s, so oil is starting. It's going to become expensive soon, but they don't know about that yet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, again, you're right on the edge of this tipping into something that isn't possible. Yeah. But also in terms of the 60s counterculture of like kind of car culture was very masculine. But in the 90s, it's a bit more accessible to women as well. This is something I just thought of recently. Because this trope of the road movie is a slightly older trope, arguably has this potential to be reclaimed. And the reason I was thinking about this was because I a few years ago did a module on small press publishing. So that's like zines, pamphlets, manifestos, that sort of small press things. And one thing that our lecturer was really keen on was this idea of seizing the levers of production, which comes from Marxist theory about the workers rising up and seizing the means or the levers of production. And what our lecturer said, like, if you look at small press and small press publishing, is that often small presses will seize yesterday's levers of production. So they'll take like the outdated machinery, which is slightly cheaper because it's not being used mainstream publishing anymore, and reuse it. And more marginal groups will reuse it for a more radical purpose outside of the mainstream. And so you have this with the 90s riot girl zines and punk zines, which used photocopiers because they were quite cheap to use as the internet was becoming more of a thing. 
And I think there are some parallels with this and Western road movie tropes, and particularly the car as a vehicle of freedom. It's becoming a more dated trope, and maybe not cheaper, but slightly less coveted. So now other groups are able to look at it and think like, what can we use this for? What other stories can we tell with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also specifically Louise's car, as we've said, is a throwback to 60s counterculture, this Thunderbird's car. So the material object of the car as an older trope that can now be reclaimed and reused. Yeah. Now that the boys are done with it, maybe we can do something interesting with it. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah. But particularly since they are women, what are the f limits to this freedom that can be gained from reusing mm. these old tools of production, these old narratives and these tropes? And can women reclaim the car, reclaim the American West? <laughs> and also, what are the limits of this narrative when you're living as a marginalized gender under a patriarchy? What are the limits within that? Yes, completely. <laughs> And so now we want to talk more about the idea of patriarchy and infrastructure, and particularly the infrastructure of the road. Yeah, so having a car obviously does give you a lot of freedom, just being able to leave your house and then leave at any point you want. Obviously, public transport is awesome, but do you have access to it? How often does a bus leave closest to you and stuff? And you have the freedom with a car to get quite far without mechanical restrictions and also without physical restrictions in a lot of ways. So mm. we would think about this because Lily referenced this in our Little Women episodes. There was this literature figure of the new woman. The new woman was this turn of the century between um, 1900s to 2000s figure. No, sorry. No, no, 1800s. <laughs> um, she <laughs> I got that wrong. Sorry, I was trying to do centuries and then went into hundreds. Yeah, I know what you got, mean. I know what you mean. Incorrect. So yeah, the new woman was this cultural figure from the turn of the century between the 1800s and the 1900s. And she was this free-spirited and independent woman, educated and uninterested in marriage and children, and was often placed against this other female type, which was the idyllic, conventionally submissive angel of the house. Which I think it's interesting to see Louise and Thelma as falling into these two archetypes. Because another thing about the new woman is that she's seen as quite standoffish, this spinster who's sexually deviant and hates children. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and um, yeah, whereas Thelma's much more in the house, in the home, submissive to Daryl, or at, least at the start of the film. And there's quite a lot that could be said about that. But the new woman... Another thing about the reason that she's emerged as well was that she had this greater freedom of movement because bicycles were more of a thing and they became this form of being able to get somewhere under your own steam. You didn't need to have a carriage, you didn't need to walk somewhere. Suddenly, places that would have been just a bit too far away to visit, like the next town over or something, which would have been too far away to visit. It was possible to do that in a day because you had a bicycle. Yeah. yeah. And with cars, you just have much more of a way to get out and explore even further. And again, Jack mm. Kerouac and this male narrative of wanting to get out and explore the world, I guess, up until you hit the ocean, you can drive anywhere you want. Yeah. And again, in this idea of getting out, what are these women specifically moving for? Yeah, exactly. This car is freedom, but freedom from what? So Thelma and Louise are running specifically from the men in their lives and from patriarchy. So they start in very patriarchal spaces, Thelma in the domestic sphere, Louise in a stereotypical waitress uniform, in very crowded male-dominated spaces. Thelma in the house is dominated by Daryl. And when Louise is on the phone to Thelma, when they're trying to have their first conversation, the first person to pick up the phone is some random guy at Louise's workplace. He's like, oh, Thelma, when are you going to run away with me? <laughs> and it's like, no, I want to... <laughs> I want to talk to Louise instead. Or I'm going to run away with Louise instead. And it sets up immediately these women in these very restrictive positions in society. And in two spaces where they're not calling the shots, they're not the people making decisions in either one of these spaces, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, of course, the inciting incident, which we've already talked about, them running away and going on the roads, is the incident with Harlan and that very specific gender-based violence. But even even before that particular moment happens, the reason they're on the road in the first place is because they are in some ways running from the male figures in their life, Jimmy and Daryl. Mm -hmm. So like Daryl as Thelma's husband is very restrictive and controlling. So Thelma's just like, I'm just going to get away. I'm not even going to tell him where I'm going, but I'm just going to leave for the weekend and then come back. And then for Louise, it's her boyfriend or partner, Jimmy, 
who we learn later they've had this argument about whether or not to get married and assert herself and to make Jimmy want her back Louise is like okay I'm gonna go away for a while and then when I come back he'll be at my feet and sort of <laughs> we'll be ready to talk so this road movie is set up from the beginning as being about running away from patriarchy about running away from the domestic rape culture and specifically the cops as an arm of pa patriarchal state. Yeah, well. that's really important. And the question is then, what are the rules of this infrastructure? The road here is part of this infrastructure of patriarchy. And if you think about roads, they are quite restrictive in a weird way. As, as, as much as mm -hmm. a car is freedom, roads are restrictive in a lot of ways because you, one, you need a driver's license. So there is government involved with letting you drive a car in the first place. There are road rules you have to follow. There's yes. cops on the road who control the road and use that to harass people. And there's a little road that keeps you in a certain limit, not quite like train tracks, which are obviously a lot more limiting, but the real road is where you're supposed to stay. You're supposed to stay in the lane. <laughs> yes, you stay in the lane. Exactly. And again, comparing it to the freedom that you get on the sea and ships, there's a lot less control of people being able to look over you just because the ocean is so huge. And also, if you're in a ship, you can kind of go whichever direction you want. Obviously, there are still traffic lanes in certain parts of the ocean, but it's not in the same way as you must stay on this particular road and just move in any direction when there's deep enough water all around you. Yeah. And... Throughout this film, the forces of patriarchy, like you said, the cops, for example, and the road is also part of it, keep trying to drag them back um, into mm, the domestic, yeah. into the patriarchal grip. And this is why they want to escape to Mexico. So, for example, at the roadside bar, they have Harlan. Again, the roadside bar is tied to this idea of the road, right? Yeah. And then, like you said before, Slocum finds Louise through her car registration. It's the police being able to ascertain where she is or like how to find her possibly and who, even who she is, right? Through her car, yeah. and through this information with the government, the CCTV in the shop, you have the cop in the wild who stops them again trying to bring them down and at the end you have the helicopter and the fbi there's just so much force and just keep different arms yeah. of the <laughs> patriarchy and of the government just reaching out and trying to grab them back and force them down but these forces yeah. do become weaker and they do become freer which is represented visually as the road degrades and they become less structured the road becomes less structured throughout the film until it runs out but it's never fully safe for them. It is safer the further they get away from the pool into the center, meaning civilization, but it is safer the further away they get. Yeah, literally. It's these limits of the quote-unquote Wild West. They're moving into that space, and the further they get away from big urban centers, the more freedom they have. However, they are never completely safe. Like you said, there's that traffic cop that they meet whilst they're on the road and this big expanse of seemingly nothingness, seemingly all alone, and then suddenly this cop car pulls up behind them. Um, so there's always this underlying feeling that even though the arm of the state is overstretched at that point, they're not completely free while they're still on the road. Yeah. Also, Thelma's going from robbing a store that you would have in different places to trading jewelry with that old guy. They keep going further away from technology. It becomes more run down and more unstructured mm. as it goes on less structured yeah absolutely there's less shops on the sides of the roads that were built for road traffic yeah and becomes much more yeah empty or unpopulated yeah and yeah and there's another trope within outlaw movies and sort of road movies the escape to mexico and for these women they want to escape to mexico because that's beyond quote-unquote civilization or american civilization and the forces that are trying to pull them back in and it's this question of what does it mean if mexico is uncivilized what does that mean if we follow yeah. that logic and we wanted to talk about that because this trope is so steeped in racism and it's this idea of this free land beyond american civilization and where outlaws can go and how problematic this is and we wanted to explore that a little bit more what that says about these narratives yeah completely it's this free land beyond american civilization and that always sets up that binary between the civilized american state versus the uncivilized sort of mexico and and you made this really great point about how in outlaw narratives often the outlaws are trying to escape down south they're trying to get over that mexican border because that's again safety from quote-unquote civilization and these laws that they're breaking Whereas in dystopian narratives, American-based dystopian narratives, often these characters are trying to escape up north. They're trying to get towards a better civilization. It's like American civilization is going down the toilet. So they're trying to get up north. They're trying to get towards 
this civilized place where they could start again, start society again as the apocalypse like descends. So there's that very distinct binary between the North being the um, future, like civilization. Yeah, yeah, future and civilization and the South being a place to escape from civilization towards a sort of more of a lawlessness. Yeah. Which is super fucked up. And it's also the sense of freedom is also very destructive towards the land that they are currently on, right? Yes. It's yeah. the thing what you said, what does that mean to reclaim these old tools of production? What does that do to the land you're currently on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This idea of like the unconquered expanse of land, the empty American West. And, you know, they ultimately end up at the Grand Canyon, which is presented in the film as this untouched expanse. But again, that ties into that narrative of it being empty land that's fine to be settled and fine to do whatever you want there, which erases the existence of indigenous peoples and the significance of the land to their cultures for many, many thousands of years. And when you do finally get to them driving through the Grand Canyon, you can see there's so much dust that they're kicking up like, from their tires. The car is a yeah. really violent <laughs> vehicle because they're just driving over just earth. And they're ripping up the ground. Yeah, it's all part of this frontier justice, frontier vigilantism. This is all part of this frontier narrative. It's fine to destroy this place, this desolate place, because it's a space without rules, because you're in the Wild West. And this place can be disrespected, which is so screwed up. Yeah. It's not feminist when women blow stuff up, just because it's not men yeah. doing it. <laughs> you're still fucking up this place that, one, this is stolen land, but two... You know, you should, even if it wasn't, you shouldn't just fuck up this entire space, not think about who might want to go here in the future. This just doesn't matter to this type of narrative. But it's such a disposability. And like, yes. I think that's something that you see a lot in petrol culture in general, this idea of like the culture around cars, um, or like the burning of petrol is really destructive to the planet. Noise pollution is very destructive. But also because you're journeying on a long road, you're not really building connections where you are. None of the towns that Thelma and Louise go through, you really apart from like Oklahoma City, but often you don't really form a connection to that place and you're just traveling through. And so it doesn't matter if you leave behind a bit of destruction because you're not going to be there again. You have no ties to that place. So there's that disposability kind of built into that narrative around this long journey because it's not about, you know, any of the individual places. It's about your journey through those places. Yeah, it's very American pioneer. It doesn't matter what you damage, what damage you leave behind, but it's about getting west and in this case, getting south. You talked about that scene where they drive through the oil field, cars and petrol culture. You are destroying the land also just by harvesting oil or you don't know what consequences that does to the environment by harvesting oil. And so when they hide from the cops, you are visually presented in this movie with the petrol culture associated with the outlaws. Yeah, completely. And so in this sense, I think the film itself is aware of this as well, that like petrol culture is inherently this white supremacist patriarchal thing. Yeah. And toxic masculinity associated with the West. And, and it's slightly difficult to reclaim this form of freedom that is so destructive. And also the need to be aware of all the racist stuff that comes alongside a road movie and the Western genre. That there are limits to the liberation and freedom that women can find within these narratives, not just for themselves, but for like the other groups and things that like these narratives and things like press as well. Because it's seen as acceptable to destroy this, because it is lawless, because it is frontier justice, because there isn't the arm of the law sort of reaching that far. Do we want to reclaim these male tropes? How do you then incorporate or think about all the racist stuff that's part of this narrative? Yeah, completely. And again, pre read text, let's get to the scene that everybody's seen if they've been, even if they haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> the ending. <laughs> Yeah, we really wanted to talk about the scene that makes this movie so iconic. I think the reason that this scene is so iconic is of the way it handles and understands these tropes, like these tropes that we talked about before. Often at the end of outlaw movies, the outlaws tend to die. So if you think about Bonnie and Clyde, they die in a car at a shootout with the cops. And this is a big trope of outlaw movies, and even in contemporary movies as well. A more contemporary example would be Hump for the Wilder People. And spoilers for Hunt for the World of People, but at the end they have this like gunfight and they have this big car chase. But the kid doesn't die. <laughs> yeah, the kid doesn't die. But and no, nobody. I don't think anybody dies. I don't think any of the cops are shown to die either. But like, it's just they're like outlaws in this movie, 
And yeah, then they have this big car chase, this big shootout at the end. And so like, you can see that this trope is like, a very big part of like the canon of Western cinema. Not even just like Westerns as a genre, but yeah. just like some cinema in general. But I think it's really interesting that Thelma and Louise decides to do something a bit different. Yeah. So at this point in the movie, they've had this car chase. They've managed to evade the cops. They're driving through the Grand Canyon, but they're being pursued by a helicopter behind and below them, out of their view, which is stalking them. And it felt like a monster jaws stalking them just below. Yeah, completely. This film definitely uses some horror tropes in this final sequence of the film. Yeah. They drive away from this like, car chase and they're, they're driving over the Grand Canyon and the two characters look out over the Grand Canyon in this panning shot and they're like, wow, look at this. And they're like, wow, it's so beautiful. I think it's significant that as they're doing this panning shot, the sky takes up most of the shot rather than the canyon itself. And I think that focus on the sky, obviously it's foreshadowing their like, final jump into the sky, but it's like, a look up and away from the world that they're on, this world that will always lock them into patriarchy. It's this fr- freedom away from this world. Mm-hmm. And they're looking up and beyond and far beyond. And then the helicopter ascends in front <laughs> of them. And there's this like kind of, it's this moment of horror and this like massive so, jump scare. So scary. And you're like, oh God. <laughs> it's so well done because you've seen the helicopter before. Like I said, you see it, and then, yeah. but then because of the way that the raises from right in front of them, but they just don't expect it. And also the helicopter having these two, like the glass in front, it just makes it look his yeah. eyes or it's something. It's like some sort of snake. It's so scary. <laughs> and it's so big and it blots out this view completely, even though it's obviously not bigger than the sky, not bigger than the yeah. Grand Canyon, but it like, takes up all of their view. And it's like linking back to the power of patriarchy, like this final display of like patriarchal power. And this final, like, the state coming in and trying to be like, no, we're stamping this out yeah. right now. Like, we're claiming our dominance over this place and over you. And like, even the sky, they're like, no, you will not have access to that. We will keep you here on the ground, on the road with us. Yeah. And then the FBI drives up behind them and lost this massive display of power. And uh, Thelma asks, uh, kind of in astonishment, like, all this for us? She's really shocked at how much state power is being put out. Because think about, like, at this point, they have shot up a tank. They have robbed the store and they have acted in self-defense, sort of, mm-hmm. when it comes to someone who was sexually assaulting one of them. So do you really need like the FBI involved for all of this? Yeah. And I think it's really interesting. So very shortly, Brigham references Robin Wood here saying... This is about the time that this was made in because this is the 90s. So say if all the major radical movements that gained so much impetus became so threatening in the 70s, radical feminism, black militancy, gay liberation, the assault on patriarchy. So what this movie, what Brigham is arguing via Robin Wood here is that this is so overblown because, again, you have the 70s being mm. so militant and um, progressive. And then in the 80s, you have Thatcher, you have Reagan. So you have this drive back of all this progressive stuff, right? You have it all become conservative again and even more conservative than it was before in some ways. And this is the 90s. They might be trying to rebel against these women. So you have to bring them back to Earth. Yeah. And that's why it's so overblown. Like, you need yeah. to make sure that you stamp that feminist stuff out. Yeah, completely. And because it's like these two two white women who are traditionally not seen as a threat to patriarchy because they're just these supposedly these passive aspects of patriarchy and so it's coming down really hard on this deviancy yeah and i think it's important also to note that they wouldn't be saying like all this for us if this was a film about black women being outlaws there's a movie called set it off which i highly recommend it's really great it's got glass being characters it's so good and it's queen latifah and it's such a good film. It's also 90s. They do not ever say like, oh, all this for us. <laughs> because they're not they're not surprised the government comes mm. down this hard on them as black women being outlaws. Yeah, and they have a much more violent outcome from the police as well in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So within this moment of the police coming in behind them, the FBI, it's setting them up for this Western style shoot off, which, as we said, is a big trope of the Western films and films beyond that and louise is ready to do this western standoff and to follow this ending but thalma is the one to say no let's keep going and let's drive off the cliff and it's really significant that they then turn their backs on authority because they know that they're going to die either way 
but they want to die on their own terms. They want to keep going. They want to be the ones to decide when the road ends. And it's going to be them. It's not going to be the cops who get to make this decision. I also love the fact that they hold hands when they do yeah. this. This movie doesn't leave you in any sort of suspense of whether Louise or Thelma made this decision. Like, this is them together. Oh, I love They're that. going to keep going. Yeah, no, that's so beautiful. Because you've seen them progress over this film to have this really beautiful partnership. They start yeah. off as quite fragmented. And then that final line, or like one of the last lines is, you know, Thelma being, oh, this is all my fault and then Louise being like I thought we should know by now this is not your fault yeah and they have each other's backs at the very end and you know in that moment they're holding hands it's not about the police it's not about any of them it's about Thelma and Louise you it's and about me those two. it's about you and me yeah yeah and so then you get that iconic final shot of the car flying off the edge of the cliff and I think that moment is what displays the limits of the road movie and is them highlighting that and trying to move beyond it almost they leave the ground of the earth because the road movie can't hold them and cannot hold freedom for them, for Thelma and Louise and for these women. And that's just such a beautiful moment. And then you get the very iconic freeze frame. We don't see the car fall down. We don't see it descend. And because we have this freeze frame, I'm definitely not the first one to make this comparison. But it's a very similar ending to uh, Les Quatre Sans Coups, or uh, The 400 Blows, which is a film by Francois Truffaut from 1959. And this film, which is a French new wave cinema film, was very iconic and very influential. It's this film about a young boy who has all these spiralling problems that happen to him and he doesn't have a lot of power and control over his life. And so eventually he ends up in this children's home and then he runs away. And then you have these very long shots of him running along. And I believe they're unbroken or at least like, they're just really, really long, basically. And he's running along these roads. And he's running and he's running and he's running until he and he runs onto a beach and he goes up to the ocean. And then he stops because he literally can't run anymore because the road runs out. And so he stops and he looks back at the camera and then the camera freezes and zooms in on his face. That's the end of the film. And it's this really iconic moment, which actually only happened because the actor, the boy was supposed to look back and keep looking at the camera. But then he looked back away again at the ocean, which he like, <laughs> and it was after this really long shot. And they were like, we can't like re redo this shot. So Especially not in 1959. <laughs> no, they were like, we only have so much film. It's expensive. <laughs> and so um, Truffaut, or I believe Truffaut, possibly like, you know, in collaboration with other people, decided that instead of reshooting or anything, the way they'd fix this was they'd freeze on his face and then do that big zoom. And which just made this very iconic moment of cinema which is very, very similar in some aspects to Thelma and Louise. Again, the freeze frame, they get to the end of the road. But whereas with the boy, you know, it's the end of the road, he can't go any further. And there's a sense of hopelessness and tension and ambiguity and what will happen to him now. He's got literally at the bottom, what can he do? Thelma and Louise end on this high. They literally end on a high and this hopeful exhilaration because they're frozen there. They are forever free. There's still this moment of ambiguity or perhaps not ambiguity because you know that the, the car must fall but you never see it fall and so in a way they're forever free and they escape the road in that moment because you never see them fall they always stay in that moment of escape and exhilaration and freedom yeah and it's so interesting because one of the actors Steven Tobolowsky if you look him up you've seen him at 4,000 things he was even I think in Glee in the beginning he's been in everything <laughs> he plays the FBI agent and he was asking in the behind the scenes stuff he doesn't understand why women continue to love this movie because it's such a tragedy why is it so empowering and I think part of it is the freeze frame because as they make the descent they mm. just do not touch the canyon in the background they are forever in over the lip still in the sky and even the soundtrack in this movie is so good yeah. and I hate when the soundtrack songs that just tell me what's happening but because the movie is so well done <laughs> it's so subtle you don't notice it and one of the lyrics yeah. in one of the songs is Better not look down if you want to keep on flying. You can keep on moving if you don't look down. Which was so funny when we realized this, because when I watched the movie for the first time, I was like, it's almost like in American cartoons where if you run off a cliff, you don't fall until you look down, which obviously is physically yeah. <laughs> impossible. But that is sort of what it reminded me of. The freeze frame makes sure that they stay suspended. Yeah. Yeah. In that moment, they're both defying the laws of gravity and also yeah. the laws of civilization. They've literally driven away from the police. And they're like, we don't care about you. We don't care about gravity. We're here together and we're in the sky. And it's sort of like, if you believe in yourself and your partnership, you could do the impossible. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's less of a, obviously not literal, like you can escape by jumping off a cliff, but it's that sort of very metaphorical trying to reach for something beyond together and it's a visual metaphor for what comes after the road movie for women how do you break beyond these boundaries and for them it was literally just jumping off this cliff 
Yeah, which also settles it a lot in reality, which is why it doesn't feel like a fantasy, right? Because you don't yeah, have that yeah. thing of, oh, and then they flew away. Like, it doesn't <laughs> bullshit you into thinking that this future is possible for you, but it does show you, as far as it can can be taken with these two, they will take it there in terms of their partnership yeah. and away from the cops. Yeah, and I think actually that's what I initially didn't understand about Thelma and Louise because I hadn't seen it. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't quite understand how this moment can be an uplifting moment Same. when they jumped off a cliff. Like, I was like, oh, it's probably, it's either comedic or it's sad. It's either comedic because they've jumped yeah. off a cliff, lol. Or like, and again, maybe that's because I've seen parody versions of it. Or it's tragic because they're going to die now. But then actually when you watch it, it just feels so exhilarating and so beautiful. And it's the kind of culmination of their friendship. And also, freezing the image then draws attention to the fact that what you're watching is a film yes. and that it is finite and nothing comes beyond that final moment. It kind of reinforces the idea that these people only exist within this film and therefore they will always keep flying. You will never yeah. see them fall. And then it fades to white. It doesn't fade to black, which you expect from a movie because you first get this hopeful heaven thing where it goes into a post-mortem of celebrating them and their journey together, their life, but not before this journey. It starts again with them taking the Polaroid at the beginning of the journey, which is so interesting because, again, it ends in a freeze frame and it starts, their journey starts with like a selfie with the Polaroid. So they are the ones yeah. setting the frame of themselves together. Yeah, literally. And again, only showing shots from within the film helps to set them up as just existing within this film. So you don't see anything before and so you won't see anything after. So they will always remain suspended beautifully beyond the yeah. road. And I think that's why the alternative ending of this film did <laughs> ruin the movie. Uh, <laughs> so like an alternative ending for this film was shot and you can find it on YouTube if you just search Thelma and Louise alternative ending. We'll put it in the... Yeah, 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 yeah as well. It'll be in the description. But in that ending, you see the car fall into the canyon and it's slightly odd because you see it fall, but it gets obscured by this kind of outcrop of rock. You see the car fall, and then you also end with the cops moving towards, they run towards the edge of the cliff. The helicopter follows them down into the ravine, a slocum on the edge of the canyon, and it finishes one of the final shots as a close up on his face and is doing some weird acting. I don't quite know what his facial expression was supposed to communicate. But it's sort of like a kind of like... It's very bizarre. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's sort of, oh, well, there's nothing. I can, a kind of hopelessness on his part, or I can never do anything about this kind of thing. The most shitty part of this movie is how the cop is situated as a good cop. His face is, again, reframing him as, well, I couldn't have done anything about this. You know what I mean? Situates him as a good guy in a bad system. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck about yeah, that. No. It's about them. It's not about you. <laughs> Literally. And it draws all your sympathy towards him. Yes, whereas exactly. the original ending, it ends with them. Your final shot and the final word is given to Thelma and Louise. And not the cops and then also in the alternative ending you see this alternative credit sequence with the credits rolling and it's a shot of presumably Thelma and Louise in their iconic Thunderbird car driving off away from you like they come out from under the camera off towards this mountain which it's actually shown at the beginning of the film. Yeah. yeah. That was one of my first notes was like, what is that mountain? Because when we watch stuff for this, <laughs> obviously we watch stuff multiple times to take note of everything we want to talk about. And one of my first notes, <laughs> looking over my <laughs> old notes, was just like, what is that mountain? <laughs> and it's the mountain <laughs> from the alternative ending. And I'm glad they didn't go with that because... Funnily enough, when they showed this movie, Ridley Scott talked about this audience's reaction, test audiences that like do not change this, which I really love. Yeah, they got it right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they understood what this film was about because once you have that shot of Thelma and Louise continuing their driving, presumably this sequence is supposed to represent a continuation. They remain friends in the afterlife, off on their journey, but that completely undermines the fact that, you know, this is their escape from the road. That final image of them jumping off is an escape from the road. If you then show them back on the road again in the afterlife, it completely undermines that statement. They're now continuously stuck within the realms of patriarchy rather than floating above in this unknown beyond, which is what the film does so well in its final official ending. It also then argues that the patriarchy in and of itself wasn't the worst part of it. Yeah. The ending works because the patriarchy remains. The road and the cops and all that remains. And this was the only possibility they had to escape it. Again, if you put them yeah. back on the road, you devalue everything that came before it. So you don't even want to go there. Don't go near the road again. <laughs> And so we wanted to talk a little bit more, just our concluding thoughts, mm -hmm. why this is so iconic. Like we said before, we think it's because this movie just understands the tropes that it worked with. And the screenwriter worked so hard with the director 
This is also a first time screenwriter. I want to point that out. What? This is the first <laughs> script that she ever wrote. I think that's so wild. Yeah. That's amazing. But she was very aware of what she was writing about and what this is based on. Yeah, exactly. Possibly it's giving the movie too much credit here. There's two endings that this film is drawing on these old genres is set up to have. There's the escape to Mexico or there's going out and dying in a blaze of glory. And obviously the escape to Mexico, this could be this alternative feminist ending. Oh, they actually managed to escape patriarchy. However, again, it's tied up in all these quite racist tropes about Mexico being beyond civilization and is also beyond the point as well a little bit. So that's not the perfect ending. And then we have the other ending, which is going out in a blaze of glory and having a shoot down with the cops. But again, this is a very masculine trope, like dying by patriarchy's terms and dying on the terms of the cops. Whereas the cliff ending gives them this alternative. You don't look back towards them and you don't look towards just continuing along the road. And it gives them the last word and action and the freedom from the road and the escape from the road. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons the movie is so beloved is because it depicts things like gender-based violence. This movie is aware of the fact that this is about mm -hmm. women and it is a female body road movie, like Susan Sarandon said, but it doesn't do a simplistic girl power narrative. And also in terms of mm. queer readings, it's so much about how much they love each other by the end. They were friends yes. before, but Thelma comes into herself when Louise breaks down because Thelma then steps up to take care of her partner. And yeah. they both just grow so much in this entire journey, but they still have to deal with patriarchy by the end. But it's about them loving each other so much and i think that's why no matter how tragic the movie ending is that's why it's so beloved by women yeah completely i think it does a really good job of grappling with that question of how do you imagine something beyond the thing that you're in i think that's often a thing that's talked about in terms of capitalism capitalism makes it very difficult to imagine what could be beyond capitalism and so you get stuck in there's no other future and i think this is a similar sort of like a capitalist patriarchy white supremacy this patriarchy is inescapable the road is inescapable and yet it has this hope and belief in something beyond that it's like i can't it's, i can only describe visually it doesn't can't necessarily have all the answers but it has this hope which you then get to see at the end which is just so beautiful yeah and yet never feels cheap i had the same thing it's so interesting that you said that now but i had the same thing when i heard about this movie i always thought god this must be so depressing to watch like what are you talking yeah. about <laughs> but then when i watched it especially when i watched it for the second time i was like god i love this so much yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful So in reference, this movie is obviously from the 90s, so it's not in production right now. The WJA and SAC are on strike right now, which is the writers and the actors res respectively in America. If you are not an American, you're like, well, why should I care? It's really, really important to support these people. These are creators. These are the people who write the stuff that we watch. These are the people who act in the stuff that we watch. They want to replace so much stuff by AI. They don't pay people enough for the work that they've already been in, and they don't even pay people enough for the work that they're doing currently, which is why they're on strike. We're going to put links to this stuff in our show notes so you can get the words from the horse's mouth, so you can see like yeah. what they're fighting for and how to support them yeah yeah support the unions and yeah fuck the studios <laughs> yeah completely it's ridiculous i always assume that yes the residuals are crap for writing and acting now because there's just so much more like there used to be three television channels and now you have all of these streaming services and stuff but they don't even pay people when they do the initial job well enough to even a lot of these people have second third and yeah. fourth jobs to be able to be writers and be able to be actors so this is ridiculous so even if you think like what do i care about actress like actress by the themselves are not necessarily wealthy or rich so it's important yeah. to support them and the union specifically exactly. like you said support the unions completely we're going to put reference for all of this in the show notes if you want to get what the unions themselves are saying it's better to generally just look at what they're posting you can follow them on social media and just see how you can support them yeah and not cross a picket line yes oh my god yes super important <laughs> Okay, okay. Lily, what recommendation would you have for people this episode? I think a piece of media that I think is definitely overlooked and that more people should be aware of is the 2019 film Rocks, which was directed by Sarah Gavron and written by Teresa Ikoko and Claire Wilson. But as the film acknowledges, a lot of the young actors of the film, as well as other young Londoners, were very involved in the film's production and in the creation of the script for the film. 
And the film starred almost exclusively non-professional actors from the local area in East London. I had read about it on Galdem, but it got a lot of critical rec- recognition, but basically no one went to watch it. I'd never heard of this movie. Yeah, it's a film that focuses on a black British teenage girl. And also it came out during COVID-19 pandemic. So and kind of the start of the pandemic when everything was going into lockdown. So yeah, so it did, did not do well in the box office, but it really deserves to do well. It's a coming of age drama starring Bucky Bucray as a black British teenage girl living in Hackney, London, whose single mother abandons her and her younger brother, Emmanuel, who is played by a really fantastic D'Angelo Usei Kisidu, which forces them to try to avoid being taken into social services. The young actors in this are so brilliant. Yeah. They're really, really good. And when I was watching it, I was like, this seems just so real. This feels really, really naturalistic in a way that a lot of films just are not. And it turns out that the way that they filmed it and created this movie is they give the actors a kind of outline of a scene and say, like, this needs to happen. Or like, this, we need to get from A to B. And then they just let them improvise and just like, talk how they'd normally talk. And that's like literally just how it feels. And the way that the young actors talk to each other and interact. And it was like a very collaborative process as well, I think. When the young actors found that the scene wasn't working for them, they stopped filming it and they were like, you know, this isn't working, we need to do this in a different way. And they were very responsive to that. And just the way that the film was made, I think, was very respectful of the actors and of creating something collaboratively and not just it being like, director tells you what to do, scriptwriter tells you what to do, which I think is really beautiful and really comes across as a really beautifully written film. But yeah, I really, really highly recommend that you watch it it's black British media, which doesn't get as much media attention as it should do. This film really deserves to be well known because it's really, really beautifully done. It's really amazing. Highly recommend. I can only second that because Lily recommended this movie to me and it was like, I've never heard of this movie. And the director also directed Suffragette, which I remember got so much yeah. press. And I'd never even heard of like the title of this movie. So I am somebody who watches a lot of movies. I was like, how have I never even heard of this? Like, I just never even heard the title of it. This movie is so beautiful. And it sort of draws you in so much into its narrative. You're going to need tissues. but <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it's it's so good. I highly, yes, I can only support this recommendation. Anna, what's your recommendation? Would you like a movie recommendation? Yes, please. With women. Yeah. Sapphic. Yeah. <laughs> directed by a woman. Yeah. <laughs> And related to Thelma Louise, hot cars. <gasps> Ooh. And rain. And do trains make you cry because of Luca? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to recommend uh, the 1985 movie Desert Hearts, <gasps> which is just so gorgeous. And I think it was recommended to me by someone on TikTok. And oh my God, it's so good. It's just such a beautiful film. And also found out when I was thinking about what to recommend. This is based on a book. And I was like, I want to read this book, <laughs> God damn it! but it's so beautiful. It takes place in Reno. It's about this professor going to Reno to be able to get a divorce because of her divorce loss. She has to go to Reno to situate herself there in order to be able to gain a divorce. And then she meets this young woman and starts a friendship with her. And I just, I don't want to say any more than that, but it's such a beautiful film. And it's just such a nice, it's just a very calm film as well. Yeah. It sort of gives you like a time to sit down and enjoy it. And I just, I love this movie so much and I think about it quite a lot it just it doesn't get as much love as it should I think it's beloved among uh, a lot of lesbians who are into movies but it should just get so much more attention than it does and it's a beautiful beautiful film it's this idea where we think gay stuff wasn't made before Mm -hmm. now or something and that's just not true you have to dig for stuff not that there was enough stuff made that is not the case obviously but there are queer movies you should check out that were made before the year 2000 and this is one of them it's so 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 good thank you yeah I do really want to watch that you've recommended it to me before and for some reason I just haven't watched it but like (laughs) I'm like I really need to watch this film everyone has such a long list of movies and stuff that they're like oh yeah you recommended this to me I want to watch but also I wanted to recommend something that was made before the strike So yeah, we've come to the end of the episode. If you enjoyed it, please rate and review us on iTunes, share our episodes, get in touch with us. And yeah, generally just let people know that we exist and that you're listening to us. But yeah, if you rate and review us on iTunes, that would be really helpful in spreading the word about the podcast. Please, please, please. Yeah. And also tell us movies you want us to watch. Tell us movies you would like us to look at in terms of pre read text or just recommend movies to us. Yeah. Our socials are Liliana Pod. That's L-I-L-I-A-N-N-A pod on tiktok instagram twitter we're liliana's pre-read mediatique on tumblr if you want to see clips Mm -hmm. of other episodes you can check those out on instagram and on tiktok we post those there and yeah yeah come come just get in touch please do yeah 
Lily, are you ready for some comedy? <laughs> I'm ready. Did you hear that Germany is going to make robot-driven cars illegal on their highways? I No. What's this about? It's going to be called Autobahn. <gasps> oh! <laughs> I really like that one. Beautiful. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I was ready for that comedy. <laughs> Thank you.